don't know if more people is coming, but well, they can go inside. So they are going to start. So well, uh, welcome to this lecture this morning. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Well, my name. Well, you don't know me. I'm Natalia Alonso, and I'm gonna be with you during this part of the master. Okay. Well, after the lecture, if you can stay, I'm gonna to share with you some organization issues. Okay. But well, now I want to introduce you our opponents today. We have here Callum, which is the creative director of Looms and Design, a studio in London. And well, they develop museum stores, which is the issue that concerns us today. And we have Lee, and she's in charge of the retail project management of these projects. And we have here some people too from Laie, which is a company from here, no? from Barcelona. We, can, we have Carmen Ferrate, and this company is the responsible, more or less, about pulling these stores of products, no? Yes. <laughs> so, well, I'm gonna leave them to introduce better than me themselves, and, and then we're gonna start. Uh, I'm gonna share with you the order of the presentation, okay? Because we're gonna have some breaks and from one issue to the other. So, well, first of all, of course, the introduction, then after, Callum is going to present what the hell is a gift shop anyway? <laughs> a personal view of what you need to know about cultural retail, okay? And after, you're going to have time for us questions, and I hope you will have a lot of questions because it's a pleasure to have them here today, so take profit of this. Well, after, we're going to have a five minutes break, and then it's going to present key elements to guide store design. <laughs> and time for questions again, and then we're gonna make another short break. Play will con well, both of them will continue presenting product development and conclude this section with consideration for students' project, okay? And questions. And well then, at the end, Callum is gonna talk about MoMA background, because the exercise of the course is gonna be about a MoMA store, so, we uh, take attention of what they are going to explain because it's going to be important for your project, okay? So that's it. I'm leave you with them and, well, enjoy because it's very, very important. Hello? Oh, right. Um, I'm going to practice my Spanish. Hola, bon dia. <laughs> Gracias per convidarme. Um, I'm Callum, Callum Lumsden. Um, I've got lots of cables here, so I'll try and get rid of them. Uh, I run a design studio in London. These are uh, my team of people. Thank you. <laughs> Lee is my makeup artist. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't do a good job. <laughs> uh, I'm hers. Um, uh, we, uh, I've. Uh, just to give you a brief uh, history of me, um, I design shops. Um, I trained at the, I uh, did furniture design in Birmingham in England, and then I went on to the Royal College of Art to do what was then called interior architecture. <coughs> when I left uh, the Royal College of Art, I knew everybody in the fashion department. And when they went to the fashion department, uh, when the, pe the, the, the people from the fashion department, they went off to work with lots of fashion retailers and their bosses started saying to them, do you know anybody who can design us a shop for no money? <laughs> and they said, Callum. So, and that's what I've been doing ever since. So um, <clears throat> I won't bore you with, with everything um, else that I've done, but um, retail has always been um, something that I've uh, I had a passion for. Um, good start. I think if you could do that occasionally. Okay. Then. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and then <coughs> the the change the change for me, um, apart from lots of other retailers that are uh, designed for was winning uh, Tate Modern uh, to do all of their shops. And that's in the year 2000 when it opened, the millennium. And Tate Modern um, has become a kind of um, benchmark for, for many uh, uh, cultural retailers. 
So, um, moving on, um, I've put what the hell is a gift shop anyway because I hate the term gift shop because the shops and museums are not just about gifts, they're about lots of other things or should be. Um, and I work in America and everybody calls it, would you like to design our gift shop? Um, and I go, mm. um, but the good ones, they understand that selling products in a museum is something that the visitors expect, it's something that makes the, uh, uh, gets money for the curators to buy their objects, um, it, it gives the stories about the museum, it's all about the brand. Uh, and that's why I find it really interesting because uh, many retailers on, uh, in shopping malls, etc., will talk about themselves as a brand. Museums struggle with that, that word, brand. Um, but the, um, the, the, the joy of uh, working in this uh, sector is that every single museum has a different thing. Uh, they have a, a, a different thing from small to large. So I'm going to talk about the, the basics of uh, museum retail. Um, and then we're moving on, as Natalia said, to talk about some of the detail. And then we're going to look at um, MoMA. Uh, MoMA is uh, seen as, uh, as the, the people that led museum retail in, in the world. Um, and hopefully you'll see why in a minute. Um, Yeah, do you want to do that? Okay. So, why do museums need shops? This is really annoying. Nope. Oh, it's working. Uh, why does it even matter in the cultural and um, destination sector? The destination sector is basically visitor uh, destinations, visitor attractions. People like the Warner Brothers uh, parks in America, uh, that, that, that kind of thing. In um, London as the Harry Potter, uh, Warner Brothers Studio Tour, things like that. Uh, let's look at the history. Uh, the evolution of um, uh, cultural retail. In the 1850s, there about, um, it was a cabinet of curiosities. It was about finding objects. This is, will I go to the microphone, would that be easier? Yeah. Hello? Can you hear me on that one? Yes, you can. Hello? Hello? One? Is that working? Hello? I don't know. No, this one. No, it's not. Yes. Hola. Not so much. Hola. Probando.
Um, in the 1850s, uh, 1800s, uh, museums were seen as a cabinet of curiosities. Um, then, as it evolved, it, it, um, it became more and more about a place for information. Books were really important. <laughs> and I stand here. Whoa! Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, there was a very famous um, uh, exhibition in London in the 1970s for Tutankhamen, uh, the Egyptian thing. Uh, there was millions of people went to that. This was, uh, and it was at the British Museum, and this was the British Museum shop. It was literally <laughs> a fan. As the 1990s developed, uh, with MoMA becoming more and more important in cultural retail uh, and Tate Modern, uh, it became more and more about gifts and widening the whole, the, the whole scope of um, what was actually being sold there. And then it became really, really interesting, and that's where we're, we're at now in terms of it's about ideas. It's about ideas um, that is about the brand, it's about the, uh, the objects that are in the museum, it's about the artists, it's people creating stuff particularly for um, the, the stores that are in uh, the museums. And obviously the rise of the internet, um, because think of customers and visitors for museum retail, because they want something that's for them. That's what's happening outside in the wider world of retail. But you'll find something that's different in a museum that you can't find in a shop out there on the Ramblers. Um, and and that's, that's the thing that uh, is really making cultural retail important and keeping up with the contemporary consumer um, in terms of their expectations, how they actually shop, what they do before they even go to a museum without thinking of shopping. Uh, but uh, my research shows that everybody expects to find a shop to take a part of their visit away with them. Because the visitors have changed as well. No longer of the, uh, the seniors. They are wised up. These guys probably smoked dope in uh, the Isle of Wight and watching <laughs> Jimi Hendrix in the 1960s. Uh, the millennials, or you guys, your expectations. Uh, the tourist is wised up. Airbnb, uh, cheap air travel. It's become such a massive global um, uh, occupation of traveling around. Uh, people want to see and buy things as well. Information seekers, entrepreneurs, and of course the family. And then there's the kids, really important. And every museum retailer dreads these guys because they come in with a uh, couple of euros and want to buy stuff and mess the place up. But they're really important also. Retail income isn't insignificant. When I talk to people about museum, uh, what do you do? I design shops for museums. They go, oh, right, OK. Um, give you some ideas. Sorry, I should have um, uh, changed this to euros, but um, I can't remember the exchange rate at the moment. But I know for uh, the UK, it's terrible. 7.7 um, .7 million pounds uh, for the V&A. Tay at 11.5 million. Just in retail, Natural History Museum 7.8, 6.2 for the National Gallery, 4.8 million for London Transport Museum. And what's interesting here is look at the amount of visitors, really low. And that's because they have got their internet, their website, their licensing, uh, all of those aspects of it really together. A uh, very clever guy um, who's no longer there, Michael Walton, uh, generated that. Well, the kind of, uh, of art, uh, Ai Weiwei uh, was commissioned to design, to use one of his objects, which is a lily, which is in gold, and they were selling it for £6,000. Um, they sold two. Uh, British Museum is the winner. I think this is slightly wrong. I think it's higher. They are the most profitable museum in the UK. Um, and to show you the importance of design, which is why all of you guys are in this wonderful building, uh, by us redesigning the British Museum bookshop, we increased sales by 75%.
uh, and the average spend by 15%. So the psychology of how product is sold in a museum is really important. And that, and I can talk to you about it for days, about the psychology of um, design and uh, enabling uh, your clients to get more profit is actually why you're here. That's what the whole thing is about. Make it look beautiful, but if it doesn't sell product, you won't get asked back again. It's, it's that simple. The Whitworth uh, Art Gallery in Manchester, they had their predict predictions and the increase, 327%. Uh, That's the best one I've ever done. But, um, uh, it was amazing. The National Theatre, we did their, sh their shop because cultural retail is not just museums. It could be an opera house, it could be a theatre. Uh, it could be, um, as I said, uh, visitor attractions. Disneyland, yeah. It's open to, there's, there's lots of kind of fun, great, interesting stuff. And boy, do you, don't, uh, you don't have to get to meet some amazingly interesting people. So that, that, that's a joy. As you can see, I'm a massive enthusiast about what I do. Um, then you go to the big boys. The Metropolitan Museum, $98 million uh, just in retail. Um, I know what their profits are, and it's terrible, but perhaps they need a new design by somebody. Um, MoMA is um, absolutely the market leader, 48 million. Uh, 2.7 million uh, visitors, and they have one gondola, and you should know all about gondolas if you're uh, uh, designing for retail. There are the freestanding units that sell stuff. Um, it generates $1 million per year just by selling mugs, notepads, key rings, um, all the kind of small stuff that everybody likes to pick up, etc. Um, the Louvre, 30.5 um, million euros, and seemingly um, the um, Palace Museum in, uh, in China, 107. Um, museum visitor destination is an opportunity to edit merchandise and to match and enhance your visitors' expectations. But it's not just about money, it's about uh, telling ideas, uh, uh, relating stories, um, and building up conversations between people. Um, and smart retail for uh, visitor and culturations um, needs to build on those experiences. I have a kind of checklist that I always talk to people about. Know your brand. Um, when, you, when you get to meet um, the trustees or the directors of a museum, sometimes you can talk about, you, you ask them to tell me about your brand. They hate that. They don't consider brand as being an idea that um, matches what they do. You're talking to academics. You're talking to enormously clever people with a vast wealth of knowledge about what they do. The commercial side of, of running a museum, for many of them, not all of them by any means, but many of them is something a little bit dirty, something that they don't quite uh, want to be involved in. Um, <clears throat> but when the retail teams actually bond with the curators and build up a trust, that's when I see um, uh, museum retail actually working really, really well. Uh, therefore, talking about the brand, I mean, what does the, um, uh, the Picasso Museum, that's obvious, uh, it's Picasso, everything to do with Picasso, the, the products should actually relate to that, how you talk about it, it's um, very important. Knowing your customer, your visitor, um, the difference between high street retail out there and museum retail is you're talking about everybody. You, you cannot define a demographic. As I've just shown you, it could be everything from school kids to, to 70 year old really cool um, seniors. And all the stuff in the middle because you think who visits um, a museum. There's no real demographic, that, that is the difference. So therefore within that store you have to account for all those different types of people and the product needs to do that as well. Uh, a good museum retailer needs to be a curator, really thinking about uh, the products, 
I guess it's in the same way as the curators will think about the exhibitions that they're going to put on. Um, simplicity, that goes for all retail. The simpler it is, the easier it is to uh, make people understand it when they come and shop in the shops. All in the detail, retail is detail, very hackneyed phrase, but it's really important. And that's the joy of design, because when you design the big picture, then you go down into the, the minutiae of, um, of, uh, of designing. So you talk about the detail of the joints and how it works and how you store. All of those kind of aspects are really, really important. Storytellers uh, tell how you actually group um, and do all the adjacencies for the products. That's really important. Uh, make it a journey of discovery. You don't want people just to come in and pick up something and buy it. You want them to walk the whole store. That's really uh, a major part of the designer's job. And mixing things up. Um, price hire, it's not about pricing in a museum shop. It's very much about it tempting people to look and find and discover and think, I'd like to take that back with me. Um, the, where things are from, provenance. People uh, really want to know if I'm going to buy that uh, bottle of wine, where does it come from? If I'm going to buy that product, what is it made of? How, how does that work? That's more and more important as we go along and har harnessing your digital presence. And then theatre, make a splash, make it interesting and fun to go to. So I thought um, the way of doing this, you can't actually just purely look at museum and visit to destination retail um, without looking at what's happening in the wide world. Um, and it's been a very interesting time, um, and retail is seen very much as um, the way, as in lots of ways, leading, <coughs> le leading um, technology and lots of other different things that you'll see. And that, that's, that's something else that's really interesting about retail. Um, and it's been a bit of a, a, a bad time since 2008, since the crash, the financial crash. Um, everybody's kind of lost trust in, every, in lots of things. Banks, politics, police, doctors, supermarkets, BBC DJs. Um, they've all kind of let everybody down. And I love putting this one, and it doesn't apply to you a lot, but in 2008, Gap was really cool. And I always like saying some people here still seem to say, think that, but I'm not saying that about you guys. <laughs> Uh, supermarkets, um, I, hope, I don't know if you've heard of Tesco in Spain, but Tesco completely lost um, its way. Uh, it started, um, it fiddled the books, it started selling horse meat. Um, <laughs> then there's things like self-service tills, which annoy the hell out of everybody. Nobody knows how, how to work it. And things like inconvenience stores uh, started popping up everywhere and really annoying everybody. And in the UK, um, we had to start paying for plastic bags. Um, I know that happens here anyway, but that was really annoying in the UK. And I thought these were interesting. And you should check this website out. There's a guy in America who has been going around photographing all the shopping malls that have been closed down in America and has produced these beautiful, haunting photographs. But shopping malls are closed. People no longer want to go to shopping malls. And you look at them everywhere and you think, well, what's going to happen next? Out of town warehouses. Um, people no longer want to do their supermarket shop in America that way, or the UK. I'm not really sure about the Spanish market in that one. But if you think of the money effort that's gone into these places, I just thought these were amazing. Um, it, it, this is art and photography as well as has a real uh, message about where retail is going. But it's not all bad news, <laughs> not to depress you. This is no scientific um, reason for this whatsoever. I made it up. <laughs> but when the economy started going down, Everybody was really uh, wanting to see what, I want, still want to buy uh, stuff, what's the, um, the cheapest way that I can do that. So on re online retail really started to move up in that way. 
Um, and then the whole link to smartphones with people looking up uh, before they even go out of their front door about where they're going, what they're going to do, uh, the tourists, the millennials, everybody's doing that. And it has changed the whole basis of, of retail. I can see everybody photographing it. There is no scientific basis for this, <laughs> I repeat. Uh, but what's happening is that online retailers, they're now coming onto the high street. Um, Warby Parker, online retailer who sells uh, online opticians. They sell specs, there's an example of them. Um, they've opened up stores all across America. I think there's something like 60 uh, now. They're beautiful shops. Um, you go in, um, you can uh, pay $110, get your eyes tested, get a pair of specs made up for you, to, um, and uh, they deliver them to your doorstep in seven days. Simple as that. So they're using all the fast approach of online retailer, but bringing that into um, three-dimensional buildings. Um, if you get to see a Warby Parker, if you ever go to the States, go take a look. They're really clever. And the staff there are fantastic. And Amazon. Amazon now have supermarkets. Amazon are now have bookshops. Um, they are completely undermining retail all around the world in a, a really uh, interesting way. And they've opened up a store where you don't even need to pay because it's all to do with what you have on your iPhone. You walk in, it clicks, and you pick stuff up, and it goes in the basket, and they walk out. Um, it took them three years to get this right, uh, but it's there, and that, they will not be the first retailers who will be bringing that uh, principle. Um, experiential is a word that I've been hearing around for a long time, but it's absolutely right. That's the difference for uh, the retail that you eventually are going to be designing for. You need to think about making it more than just going in to buy something. It's got to be an experience. And that, to me, is the exciting part. So pop-ups are becoming more and more uh, important. It's a, been a very uh, overused term, but Adidas did this one. And I love this one. This is a mountaineering product uh, uh, retailer. And they put a pop-up on the side of a cliff. <laughs> I didn't make this up. Um, there's a fantastic... Um, <laughs> there's a fantastic um, uh, restaurant uh, operation. It's very... Uh, do you guys know the El Nacional... Um, uh, it's not a restaurant experience... Um, it's a, uh, Italy is an Italian version of what you have there. And they're now opening up Italy World. You actually go uh, and experience it. It's a theme park um, for food. And then back to provenance, I mean, food retail is really in, in, interesting at the moment as well. Um, and then uh, in Germany, uh, Rose Bike Town, you could go into the store, you can choose... Uh, the framework, the wheels, the seat, the handlebars, the bell, the whole damn thing for a, a bicycle. You can choose your colour. They'll make it up there and then, and then there's a cycle track in the store and you can uh, ride your bike all around it and test it out. Um, and then, of course, there's Apple. Apple's always is seen as being absolute pioneer, and they were. Um, the whole idea of using iPads rather than having a cash and wrap uh, sorry, cash and wrap, uh, counter. Um, America, they call them cash wraps. Just a little um, difference. Nike, uh, make up your own uh, shoe, your running shoe. And this one was about um, uh, rare, um, uh, low, de low density um, product uh, shoes, running shoes again, um, which you used it like you do in a, in a fun fair. So it was actually kind of making fun of it. Of buying a product. And then AI, artificial intelligence. Um, so far, as far as retail is concerned, all I'm seeing is uh, 1950s type cartoon versions of robots. Uh, this one called Mio will find you in the park and it'll have uh, cans of Coca Cola and uh, Fanta um, and it will ask you, would you like to buy it? And da, da, da. 
<laughs> yeah, okay. Um, great brands are getting stronger. One of my favorite brands is Muji. And uh, Muji have just exploded in such a, an interesting way. Uh, the new store in New York um, is something like, I'm trying to get this right, 500 square meters. Um, no, 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 sorry, 50. 5,000 5, square meters, sorry, I'm still thinking square feet because I'm British. Um, it's, it's massive, they sell everything from plants to um, uh, cafe, there's a cafe in there. Um, and they're now starting to sell food. They have become uh, selling um, uh, food products, it's a supermarket. Interestingly, they're also um, opened up in Tokyo um, a bookstore. Uh, and it is full of people reading books. Now, if you talk to people like Lee or uh, my clients, books don't make money. Um, but actually, books are turning around in an interesting way, and I think people like J.K. Rowling are responsible for people really wanting to read. And in Tokyo, the bookstore was full of people sitting, having a cup of coffee, cup of tea, reading books, buying books, and the Hong Kong Book Fair, I heard the other day, the average spend per visitor was uh, £89. How does that translate into euros? 95, or Nin 95 euros. The average spend, which is inc incredible. So over in that side of the world, books are becoming really, really quite important. And there's a project that I'm doing in Hong Kong at the moment where they're talking about 40% of the product will be books. I went, oh, um, um, but they talked to, talk me out of uh, questioning that. And diversifying, H&M, you know, at H&M, this is their version of an upmarket um, uh, fashion store that they've just opened in London called Arkit. And it's a very cool fashion-led um, uh, retail offer. Uh, retail is a political statement. In Hamburg, for one day, this supermarket only sold products that was made in Germany. And the shelves were empty as a statement about why we need uh, immigration should not be an issue, etc., etc. Um, I thought that was a really interesting, clever one. And it's not just about selling product. Um, it's, it, it really is the whole kind of aspect, the enjoyment about um, uh, visiting the stores. So looking around about what's around, um, this is the Broad in Los Angeles. Um, the Flintstones comes to retail. Um, <laughs> in this one in uh, Berlin, the, the museum, Dardinj, um, the way that they made a difference was by the pa just by the packaging. Everything is white, really simple, really kind of cool. Um, that matches their brand because it's a very kind of cool place to be. Um, so it's not just about, you know, the table legs and um, uh, what's on the surface here. It's, all, it's actually building on that whole experience. In Vienna, just to give you an idea of the diversity of the products, because yes, key rings, fridge magnets, mugs, all of that is, are important. But the diversity of this kind of a product range is not a great slide. It shows that you can have a lot of fun with, with the products as well, which actually match the kind of stuff that I guess we all like in this room. Um, and somebody, this was for another talk I was doing, was asking me what is happening in retail that's interesting. Now, I don't know if anybody around there, but these guys here will know that these are the four tops. And they did a very song which is called Reach Out. That's why that's there. I tried to get the sound on it, but um, the, te the technology wouldn't do it. And what, what museums are doing, they're actually reaching out. They're going further than just where their location is. Uh, the British Museum, their teams are going out and um, consulting with people in Abu Dhabi, in Hong Kong, in Japan, uh, South America, and mainland America as well, North America to show how um, retail should be done. Because it, all the museums are wakening up to the idea that, oh God, there's something really important that we should be doing a lot better. Um, so design 
uh, and the retail part is actually kind of big, is, is a big deal. Um, MoMA, um, they have their existing store. I'm going to be talking about MoMA in a lot more detail at the end of this. Um, sorry if I'm going over time here, but um, they are, uh, they have their stores in the museum itself and it's going through a massive remodel at the moment. They're spending eight hundred million dollars on refurbishing the whole of the museum, including the stores. Um, they've got quite a good designer working with them. Um, and, but they also have their own store, standalone store, on West 53rd Street. And they have a store in Soho, uh, in uh, New York. Um, this is the one that we just did, uh, design store, uh, West 53rd. But they're also, uh, they've also they had a store in um, Tokyo now for about 10 years, and they have um, negotiated their license with what the big, one of the biggest department store chains in Japan called Loft, and they are uh, opening up stores within um, the Loft department stores all around um, uh, Japan, uh, including a standalone store in Os uh, Osaka, which is this one here. Um, then there's the main new store, um, which is going to be a real flagship for museum retail. And then there's M Plus. M Plus is in Hong Kong. It's on the West Kowloon uh, district. It's uh, not, um, the uh, Hong Kong uh, authorities have built onto the sea of Hong, of Hong Kong, and they're developing a, a, which is basically an island, which will hold a Museum of Modern Art an opera house, a theatre, a people's palace uh, of China, uh, hotels, uh, shops, apartments. Um, it's, an, it's an amazing uh, investment. Uh, and M Plus, you'll be hearing a lot more about them because they want to do exactly the same as MoMA and spread their license around um, uh, the uh, Pacific and um, east, eastern part of the world. And these are just a little few glimpses of some of the designs that are happen going to happen quite soon. So really quite different for uh, museum retail, I hope. And then the Victoria and Albert Museum in London is very famous, the V&A. And they're opening up. Uh, they have um, commissioned an amazing architect. Look him up, Kuma, Kuma Como. Um, I'll spell it for you later if you want. Uh, he's designed this amazing building in Scotland, in Dundee, right on a very famous river, the River Tay. Um, <coughs> to, and the, the, the v and a have great plans to open up, just a bit like uh, the Guggenheim has, has, has done as well, um, like Bilbao uh, and all the other ones. So people are kind of actually seeing the opportunities. And it's not just about retail, obviously, but the retail needs to uh, react to all of that. These gives a few glimpses of what's happening in uh, Dundee. And then a very interesting one in South Africa, the Museum of, of Contemporary African Art. It's the first modern art museum in Africa, uh, which is an astonishing thing to think about. And they have some of the most amazing artists, uh, South African and uh, Gambia, the whole lot. Uh, the, the art that I saw in this place. It's a Thomas Heatherwick um, uh, conversion uh, that they've done. And retail is really important for that too. Um, nearly finished. Um, Andy Warhol, I hope you've heard of him. Um, when you think about it, department stores are kind of like museums. I thought that was really quite interesting observation, but that was in the 1960s, 1970s. And Lee found this one a good while ago. Uh, let's hope that the technology works. It's a really good illustration about how uh, cult cultural, the cultural world meets um, the retail world. Let's see if we can get this to work. Oh. I knew this would happen. Well, you got it working this morning. No. 
no sound. You have to, the sound really helps, it's such a shame. Nothing on there? No. <laughs> it's amazing bringing this painting to life in a shopping mall and, and meeting the people where the people are and, you know, encouraging that. Uh, kind of crossover. Isn't that great? Brilliant. Yeah. Ta-da! <laughs> <coughs> if I find the sound, we'll play it. We'll play it again. And of course, I think that what's really important is everybody's photographing this, so yeah. and that's being around <laughs> social media, so the whole world gets yeah. to know about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and that I mean, it's, exhibition merchandising is so critical to the, the the sales in any any museum, and this is such a great promotion for that, tying in with the sponsorship and and bringing people into the museum who are going to then want a picture of that. <laughs> Just love it. What I've always uh, admired about this is how, <laughs> the, how they managed to get this, all the right camera shots, etc. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, oh, so um, exit through the gift shop. Definitely not. Thank you. Okay. Have we got, have we got time for a break, or do, should we keep going? Would, yeah, has anybody got any questions? Has anybody got any questions? Yeah. I do see. Yeah? Okay. Um, I have a question about the connection between the museums in London. If there is any kind of like marketing strategy in which they... I mean, I know there's sometimes these kind of facts that you have one ticket to get into one museum mm. and you can buy a couple of things. But yeah. it's more into a um, logo level or imagery level, you know, like if, you, if there's a connection inside the shop with other museums such as... No, no, the, the, um, everybody's really quite bad at that. They uh, like that. Uh, it's not that they don't like it, it just doesn't happen um, for whatever reason. I think they're probably might be an opportunity. Um, I mean, it, you know, you're right. Uh, the opportunity on a website that collaborates everybody together could actually be really, really good. Um, everybody knows each other. It's a very kind of incestuous kind of uh, business. But uh, no, it, it doesn't happen. I don't know if they've even tried. It's still quite you competitive, but, but yes, we, we have tried a lot, actually. Uh, in my old role, the National Galleries of Scotland, we we created product that then wholesale to other institutions. I used to distribute the National Gallery products in Canada mm. um, through the museum stores there and things. So there is a little bit, but it's still very competitive amongst amongst museum shops, which is too bad because I think more collaboration is good. When it really happens is when there's a traveling exhibition. And so you get uh, art from uh, other other museums. Right now, there's a Gauguin exhibition in in Paris, and there's product there from the National Galleries of Scotland because some of their paintings are in that exhibition. So there's that, but it's mm. it's yeah. it's not terribly collaborative. This point. Um, like about which percentage of product is uh, directly directed to to the I mean, because there's like this offer, right? Of books and... Uh, 
Yeah, sure, I know what you're saying. The, you, um, the good ones will be as high a percentage of products relating to their museum as possible. The bad ones will be the ones that you will find, you know, if you think of the natural history museums, yeah. How often do you go and see lots of fluffy tigers or <laughs> dinosaurs or what? And that all comes from pretty well much the same place. There's, there are companies that will supply museums with all of that. So there's no differentiation. Uh, and then they wonder why people aren't want, you know, because if you're visiting, uh, well, if you're visiting London, yeah, which is the one I know best, you know, uh, visitors will go to many of the museums within that one trip, British Museum, the Natural History Museum, Science Museum, DNA, da 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 da. Um, so they, they're not going to buy, you know, um, a fluffy toy from one place and another fluffy toy from another. Um, that, that's why it's really unless, important. Unless they're different. And, I mean, the, the Natural History Museum has their own uh, curated range of, of, pl of soft toys that mm -hmm. are based on their, their curators have scrutinized and made sure they're as accurate as possible. But you're absolutely right. The best museum stores, I mean, I would aim for, uh, most of my clients, I aim for about 70% custom goods because that's your USP. That's your unique selling point. That's why cultural retail isn't as hard hit as the high streets because you've got original product. We'll get in, I'm, we're going to be talking about product this mm -hmm. afternoon a bit too, so, um, or a little bit late, whatever time it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yes, it's, it's, it's critical, uh, just doing the project in Canada and 70% of the product's going to be bespoke, as we call it in the UK, uh, custom product. So. Um, <coughs> It really is, it sets you apart, it makes you less price sensitive. So. Anything else? Anybody else? You. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> when you were talking about the relationship you have with the uh, museum owner? Yeah, yeah, or director. It's usually director, yeah. So, like, what kind of on how to approach these people. I'm from Mexico. When I have this paradigm that mm -hmm. they're super these kind of um, wait, I have to think it in Spanish so I can say it in English. <laughs> That's better than I'll yeah. be able to do. Yeah. The, um, the, the hierarchy of a museum will be the director, who is God, <laughs> yeah. and then the disciples will be the person in charge of finance, and then they will have um, the people who look after all, the, all the, the different parts of the museum. So there will usually be a director of finance, and there will usually be a director in charge of all things commercial. And then there will usually be a, a director of uh, somebody who looks in after all things academic. So they will be the curators. The people that you need to get to is the director of the commercial. And sometimes you will find a retail director as well. And if you go in and say, I know how to make you uh, your shop 
so much better. And I can prove it with figures, like the ones that I've shown. Yeah, they'll listen. And they'll go to the chief financial so you speak guy. Money first. Sorry? You speak money first. Like you say, yes. yes. Absolutely. You a lot of money. Because if, it, whether you're d designing for museums or H&M or Tesco's, the thing that will make those businesses listen to you is what we do makes you more money. But the good thing is that design always, without exception, makes them extra money because it, it makes customers want to go and shop. That's, that's, that's the skills that you're bringing to the table. But at the same yeah. time, when you, when you are talking to the directors, and I'm going to do a PhD project on directors of museums, because <laughs> um, there are many different types. Yes. And uh, some will be on side. The director of the British Museum, way back, mm. took me into his office and showed me all the things he wanted to have made, and everything was completely keen on... On, on, on making things happen. Others, it's like you're the money changers in the temple. We, we, you know, you're going to demean the, the art that we're here to preserve and protect. So we don't really trust you to, you know, get it right. So we're going to scrutinize everything you do to make sure that the, the, the collection and the messages that we're trying to give off as a museum are, are maintained and that you're not going to you know, make it too commercial um, and sell a lot of plastic and sell a lot of things mm. that we think is beneath us. So you have to just gauge who you're speaking to and what level of interest they have. But money uh, always talks. It's an, it's yeah. an illustration. And Well, the other uh, group of people that um, and we were talking about this last night, the other group of people that uh, you normally have to work with are the architects. And the architects, uh, if you're looking at some of the examples I showed you at the end there, uh, you're talking about the absolute superstar architects. Herzog de Muron, uh, Norman Foster, uh, Thomas Chipperfield, uh, who, not Thomas Chipperfield, well, David Chipperfield. <laughs> um, all of those guys, they have their vision about what their building should be. Um, and. David Adjie, I don't know, do you know what David Adjie? Uh, fantastic um, architect, I like him. Um, <laughs> they, they have this, and they usually have the ear of the director, so there's this very difficult um, balancing act, because the retail guys want um, a, a shop that works, and the architects want no mess. You know, they don't, you know Herzog de Muron, I guess you know Herzog de Muron, uh, architects, when I did Tate Modern, they actually announced on television, why do we need a shop in a museum? This is a museum, we don't, we don't, need, we don't need a shop. Nicholas Sorota, i.e. Sir Nicholas uh, Sorota now, fired them and refused to let them have anything to do with the shop at Tate Modern after months of debate, blah, 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 blah. They are a bit of gossip for you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> With the extra challenge of the experiential issue. Yes. Uh, yeah. So you have to. Uh, yeah. So the, the create that world inside a uh, space, which is more easy. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, so there's lots of kind of different. You you don't become you you do, you're not just a designer. You actually become an ambassador, a diplomat, yeah. and as, especially <laughs> as well. With architects and things, having had lots of different experiences like you with architects, it's about uh, talking their language, as you will be able to do, but it's also understanding the vernacular and the style and, and making sure that the retail shop is, is part of the seamless experience of the visitor, that you don't feel like you're walking into a shopping mall, that you don't feel like you've left the building, that you still, the colors, the materials, as much as you can imbue the, you know, the store design with what the visitor has just seen and felt in the environment they're in, whether it's colors, typefaces, like, you know, all of that helps continue that journey and not you know, cut it off sharp from what they've just experienced. So often, 
that can help with the architectural discussion too, to yeah. make sure that you understand that vernacular that they're using, that you want to you know, have that show up in the shop sure. as well. Break. <laughs> okay, so let's take a break. Okay. Thank you, guys. Five minutes. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes.
Hello? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm going to get into the bit of the nuts and bolts now, which with not as many pretty pictures, but the important bits too. I'm Lee Stevenson. I'm a consultant. Um, previously, I uh, was with many different museums, the National Galleries of Scotland, as the managing director of the commercial activities. Um, my background, I studied at London College of Furniture and Interior Design originally, and then went into fine art and art history. While I was doing that, I opened a design store while I was at university and fell in love with retail. Went to a company that is equivalent to Harvey Nicks, so it's called Holt Renfrew in Canada, 18 department stores, high end, with a mandate to be highly profitable and totally exclusive. Price did not matter, it was very high end. After that, I wanted to join some sort of charitable <laughs> organization because selling to people with all the money in the world for at any price didn't do my heart good. Soon, whoops. Soon as I uh, uh, left there, I went to the Royal Ontario Museum where I was head of retail for eight years with four stores and a couple of different sites and things and just absolutely adored it and fell in love with it and became very passionate and very committed to the idea of cultural retail because I think there is so much depth to it. It's, it's really um, gives you a better feeling that you're doing something for culture, you're doing something to engage people with art or with science or with history or whatever. So I am I'm quite a passionate um, advocate for the world of cultural retail. Unfortunately, in the, as to what's happening in the high street, cultural retail has not been very hard hit at all because people want to buy something, not only about their experience that they've had, but to give something that comes from somewhere that they're supporting through buying that gift and giving it on to other people. So that's kind of why I do what I do. And uh, unlike Calm, I've got some notes here because you know, I'm, the, uh, I'm the list maker in the, in the team, I think. Um, I'm a bit of the ringmaster. Uh, I'm the client, really, that you'll be dealing with, hopefully. Sometimes I'm not the client, sometimes it's the director of museum working with the architect and then at some point they work with me to decide whether they like my ideas or not or they're just going to go ahead and do what they want anyway and then I have to be the one to make it all work. So um, it's something to keep in mind as you're going out into the world and working with clients uh, that you need to engage quite a wide group of people to make sure you're getting all the information you need and I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, so I, my idea is that you know retail has to be an asset to these institutions. It can't be uh, detrimental to their mission and their vision. It needs to really be something that adds to the visit, that adds to the dwell time of the visitor, that um, is another reason for people to go to the museum as well, because repeat business in this destination retail that we're talking about is vital to a sound retail business in a cultural attraction. Um, so to, I help determine what the retail strategy is going to be for a retail store in a cultural institution. Now Callum's talked about all of the world's leading institutions and he's just been uh, amazingly um, hired to do all these spectacular stores with lots of money. My business is a bit more schizophrenic. It's, <laughs> it's zoos, aquariums, it's museums, it's history museums, it's all kinds of different sites with very different needs and very different deliverables. So when I work with a client, I decide what kind of strategy they need to suit their institution, their institutional goals, their missions, and their customers. Um, I also set retail policies and practices, and I'm the one that's got to make what you do at the end of the day when the store is designed and open and looking as perfect as the slides that you've seen. I'm the one that has to keep it looking that way, who has to deliver the profitability, that has to see that the customer is served well, that the visual merchandising is up to par, that we can keep up the displays that have been you know, designed and set up, 
um, and the, the customer gets no idea of how much work behind the scenes goes into this. Um, and another thing, and that's most of these places are open seven days a week. So when do you re-merchandise? When do you do that? So it needs, I'm the one that's got to make sure that that can all happen smoothly. I set the key performance indicators, which I'll show you, goals, budgets, and um, determine what the retail stories are going to be. We talk about stories, and we talk about storytelling in shops, in retail, in the high street, or, or in cultural uh, sites as well. And those need to be very tightly controlled and changeable, particularly when you have destination shopping. So we determine what those stories are, and we plan them out over the years. Um, so at the end of the day, the buck stops here with me. I've got to deliver the profitability and the turnover and the sales and service and all the key messages of the institution through the retail store once you've finished designing it. And the other key thing on, on some of Calum's slides is that uh, the turnover is not the profitability. And often the, the running of a retail store can eat up a lot more of the profits than you want it to be. So that's, I walk that fine line between culture and commerce and making sure that we deliver a bottom line. And those bottom lines vary from client to client. So, um, the first thing we talk about when we look at retail models, um, was there one before that? Yeah. Um, there are different kinds of models for retail stores. This high throughput, high net profit, um, often I find when working with a zoo, like the Parc Zoologique de Paris, uh, a huge store, um, 6,000 square meters, and they get sometimes 10,000 people through a day. So how do you design a store that can accommodate 10,000 people, re-merchandising displays, filling up, getting people through without, you know, people getting annoyed, not being able to check out easily and all those sorts of things. Is that the kind of store you're designing? Is a high throughput, cashiers, not salespeople, you know, what, what, is that the model you're going for? The next one is where you get a hybrid of uh, goals that your client will set for you. Profitability is always important, but often to institutions, as we were talking about earlier, it's about the overall objectives, their brand, whether they like to talk about it or not, but they all want to get their mission and vision through to the public. Because at the end of the day, that's how they're judged uh, for their revenue from the government who fund them and things like that. They want to see those missions and visions delivered. Retail can help do that. So if often there's a balance. We've just gone through this exercise with one client where there was one avenue we could go which was highly profitable immediately. There was another that was a hybrid, and there was another that was cell phone owned and operated, lower uh, immediate turnover, not turnover, sorry, lower profit immediately, but put their goals long term was to get their brand out, to create their own product, to develop uh, their mission and vision. So, they're just deciding between which model to go with now, but we did the financial modeling and they have to decide. That tells me and will inform you of how the store needs to be designed, whether it's strictly profit, vision and mission, and how many people they need to put through and accommodate. Um, this is exclusive, exclusivity and high end. Um, a shop that just needs two or three items on a shelf, like a high-end handbag store or something like that, um, is great, but is that your customer? Is that their customer? They may want that, but the reality is, can I make the profitability they want by having that? You said they sold two Ai Weiwei uh, things. That's great, but is that, is that gonna you know, pay the bills at the end of the day, and is that gonna make them the money? And actually, in cultural retail, that artist-driven product is, is, has been very, very successful. So the Tate did 400,000 of one limited edition print, 400,000 pounds of one limited edition print run from an artist. And 
So there are ways to, to do that, but uh, it's very difficult to, to have, depending on the attendance, and we'll get on to that next, uh, of a, a high attendance history museum, for instance, where you've got grandparents, children, family groups, school groups coming through. That approach has to be segregated. It should be there, but it, it, you need the, uh, the pocket money, as we call it, the pocket money and the bread and butter product as well to, to suit the majority of the customers. Um, so, <laughs> assisted. Uh, and then at the end of the day, we really, to protect yourself from the vagaries of museum attendance, because museum attendance goes like this. You have a Ai Weiwei exhibition, you have a Warhol exhibition, you have an eso esoteric uh, exhibition from somewhere that attracts 10,000 people maybe, as opposed to 100,000 or 200,000 people. So one year your attendance can be 500,000, the next year it can be 700,000, the next year it can be 300,000. As a retailer, how do you protect yourself from that? You need to have changing product, exclusive product, your own brand product. You need to bring people in on a regular basis. They need to think of you as a shop for Christmas, for presents, for all of those things. So how do you do that and keep your unique selling point without being a gift shop? And that's, that's where the destination retails. Because the board of directors at a museum will never remember that you had an extra 100,000 people coming through your store last year. They'll just see your results and say, you haven't done so well this year. Why? And you can explain it's still, it's still a problem. So this destination concept is very important. Next, please. <laughs> um, so. Attendance. This, this will drive a lot of things for you. Make sure you understand their the attendance expectations of any client you've got. Um, for instance, school holidays uh, for a zoo or an aquarium, you may get 9,000 children through a day. How do you handle that as a designer? How do you handle the store flow? How do you handle the, the, the display units and things that you need to to make sure that all those people have a good experience going through. It can be tricky. But um, so that's, that's something you need to keep in mind is, is, you know, what is their attendance? When do people come? Who are they? Uh, Portugal, the Oceanario de Lisboa, um, they get Brazilians in the summer. And they don't in the winter. And so the whole product has to change because it's a very different customer. So we had to you know, figure out how to handle a completely different product range in the summer when they had you know, visitors, more tourists and things, and um, even adjust the colors of things too during that period. So it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite an interesting thing to get, get as much information as you can about the attendance expectations. Um, are they trying to capture a different market of customers in, in the future? Uh, that can also affect choices that you make in, in the retail store. And um, what, what exhibitions are they planning? Blockbusters or pandas? Pandas can add a million euros to your revenue if you have a panda at your zoo. So all of a sudden from doing this, you go up to here and thousands and thousands more visitors. So it, it's a very odd business. It's quite a sort of up and down business um, for a lot of institutions. So that's again, it affects the retail design because it affects the traffic flow, it affects the kind of merchandise you sell. Important to understand that. Sir. Demographics. Yeah, again, this is what I call schizophrenic retailing because as Callum said earlier, anybody is your, is your audience. It changes from type of venue to type of venue. Art museums, as a, as a rule, get um, people around the 40 year age, 20, 20 to 45, 50, as the, the bulk of their visitors would say. But history museums uh, and natural history museums get a much broader cross-section of people and family groups and grandparents and children and 
Whereas art museums are actually quite intimidating for a lot of the general public. So it's about trying to get non-traditional groups into the art institutions, but generally you'll find that history museums have a higher attendance because of that. Look at the, the British Museum, etc. Um, and so that's why the retailing, whereas somebody like John Lewis or my old company, Holt Renfrew, um, let them go by. They, have, they actually have customer figure types. They, they know what their shoppers look like. They know where they live. They know what they like to eat. They know how they like to dress. They target a certain area if you're on the high street. Can't do that in museum retailing. It's just everybody. It's somebody wants a, a 50 pence postcard to somebody who wants an IYWA item. So that's why you've got to cater to all these groups. The biggest challenge is always the student groups, though, as you said earlier, because uh, they come in 30, 40 at a time and it can cause chaos. So exit through the gift shop. Um, there was, for a long time, a lot of people saying, oh yeah, it's the only way to make money is to push people through your gift shop. It can be the worst shopping experience of all. And I maintain if you're a good retailer, and you have good design and good sight lines to the visitor, that that's a much better shopping experience. It's a much better dwell time. Um, and people don't feel offended that they've been pushed through, you know, uh, sort of like a, there's, there was quite a backlash for a while about being pushed through a gift shop to leave. However, uh, often you get into a situation where an architect has designed a building we had this in the, um, the National Aquarium in, in Copenhagen, and um, the architects had already designed the shop as the exit for the, the uh, aquarium. And uh, on peak days, weekends, and school holidays, the staff could actually not get to the other side of the store. Nobody could shop when people were trying to get through with strollers and, and family groups and things, so if a shelf something fell off a shelf the other side, it was hopeless. You could not actually get through the bodies going through the, the shop, which made a terrible shopping experience. So uh, a year <laughs> after they designed and opened the building, they were already beginning to renovate to, to change that. So just pay attention to that. It's very, it's very difficult. Um, and also, I think destination shopping is very difficult then, and well, it's almost impossible because people can't enter the shop with, if it's an exit. It's, it, you can't do that because you need to buy a ticket to get through and, and it's very rare that you can work out a way that that can happen. So be conscious of that. This is kind of the dull part, sorry, but it's the nuts and bolts of what makes it work. You know, at the end of the day, you guys leave, it looks beautiful, but I've got to make it happen. So, uh, let's see. Uh, interesting, I uh, gave a talk in Paris a few years ago with... Uh, a curator, and he felt that the museum shop should be like visiting the Stations of the Cross. When you go through a museum shop, you should see the curatorial departments, you know, uh, segregated in the shop. And in fact, we did that in the Parc Zoologique. We had to do all the merchandising by biozones. And um, it can work, it can be difficult, but the important thing is that uh, there's a statistic that says 30% of visitors go to the shop first before they go to the, the galleries. And um, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. It may be a bit like your information on the <laughs> your charts. But um, if that's so, they should have a, an idea of what they're about to see. And it should interest and excite them. They should get an idea of what is in the galleries. So I think it's not a bad idea. I don't think we need to take it quite so literally, but um, you really need to make sure that that shop, whether you've seen the galleries or not, will tell you a bit about what you're about to see when you go in. So the product and the whole feeling of the shop should reflect what you're about to see. Um, so that's why, the, you know, prioritizing the importance of the collection, and that, again, that will inform your design. If there are key elements um, 
of the curatorial disciplines of the galleries. If you look at the floor plan of a museum and you see that the Egyptian gallery, for instance, is much larger than any other gallery, that's going to tell you, you know, what kind of section you need to create as, as you know, in my role for an Egyptian offer because, say, that's the most popular gallery. You need to think about those things when you're reflecting this in the store design and how, how you're going to have power walls of, for Egyptian art or you're going to have power walls for Indian or African or whatever it is. You need to think about how you're going to zone the store. Uh, so that's kind of, the other good thing to do is look to see where the carpet is worn out in front of which paintings and things like that kind of tells you where people are, are visiting and what, uh, what, uh, what areas of the collection they're most interested in and that really needs to reflect in some of your pictures you had of the new stores you had a big poster of an image from the collection and then below it is the merchandise. It's a very important design element in retailing is to have that power wall, to have that, make that statement and connect the visitor to what, you know, they're picking up a mug. They need to know where that came from. They need to know what, what your inspiration for that was. And they need to know a bit about the romance and the, the, the history of that item. And that really sells the product. So that, that's going back to, to store design. Yeah, so I kind of talked about this. What are the best sellers currently? Uh, that'll be based on the collection, but is that something you need to really take into consideration? I mean, if the best seller is uh, an Alessi coffee maker or something, do you, you need to fixture to that. What are their key things that they really want to capitalize on in their store presentation? So how do you relate that to your design and your fixturing? Um, and also how much, I think you talk about it a bit later, about the zoning of different departments of goods and um, when we do a store assortment plan, we know that jewelry is going to be X percentage of the, of the assortment. You need to get this information from your client is, is what are the department breakdowns? How much room do you need for jewelry? How much room do you need for prints and posters? How much room do you need for toys, kids, pocket money thing? You need to get that information because that needs to help figure out your footprint of the store and what kind of fixturing you need. Um, everybody always wants more space for all these departments, by the way. So something has to be reduced often. If they're not expanding the store, something needs to go. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to get out of your client is okay, we're going to expand the jewelry or we're going to expand, you know, this area, category. What can we contract? Because perhaps you're just renovating a store and you're not going to get any more space. And it's often hard for them to, to take something away. Okay. <laughs> okay. So do you know about KPIs? Do you have you talked about that in your program at all? Key, key performance indicators? Yeah. In museums and cultural retailers, they're kind of the same but kind of different from the high street. So spend per visitor is uh, one of the first things we look at. Is, and in Callum's slides, although it didn't break out the spend per visitor, you could figure that out because you had the attendance and the sales. So you need to know initially what is their current spend per visitor. What do they want it to go to? What do you think you can help them deliver by your store design? Um, average transaction value means for every, tra every transaction that goes through the till, uh, how much, what value is that? And that, again, the higher you can get that to go, the better. Square meter sales, obviously, that's standard for everywhere, um, as is average transaction, but um, that's something that needs to be maximized. And in every fixture you do, you have to think about how much product they can get on it and how much uh, profitability they can make from it. This is another key one, conversion rate of visitors to customers in the store. Um, some of that has to do with store placement. Some of that has to do with ease of access to the store and ease of moving through the store. If people look in and see it's too crowded and they can't see a clear path through the store, 
they might not go in. So you want to entice them in as much as you can. Uh, make sure that you're converting them to, to customers. And um, this is another one, the cash wrap, as we call it. No, cash and wrap. Um, this is something that can often be a, a really difficult thing, is the placement. What kind of store are you designing? Is it one with a high degree of customer service where the sales staff are out on the floor helping customers, or are they cashiers? How vulnerable is your product? How much theft do you have in the area? How do you have to protect that? Do you need to be by the exit so that you can really keep an eye on customers because there's a high level of people coming in to steal, protect, you know, to protect your goods? Or are you able to be more gracious and, and, and locate that cash wrap further away? But again, that's, that's your area really of expertise, but it needs to work for me as an operational person. It also needs to work in the customer service way. I don't want to see anybody in any of my stores fiddling, trying to find a place to wrap something, to, to you know, make a transaction. You have to, in this day and age, the customer service has to be seamless, it has to be easy, it, you can't have people looking for bags and boxes and things behind the cash and unpacking goods on the cash registered, you know, thing. It needs to be very smooth. It needs to be a pleasant experience for the visitor. So how you design that cash wrap area is really critical. And also to know if, in some places, they actually don't have a stock room or they don't have a place to take in goods easily because they're small museum shops and do they need a place behind the cash where they can do that without the customer having to see all that. That is really critical operationally that that is seamless. Your design can be great but if it doesn't function for the customer service side then it's, then it, it's not going to work so well. Um, the last thing you want to see, there's one store that was redesigned and when you went by the window you saw the back behind of the cache with all the bits and pieces and the, and the bins for waste and stuff and you looked in the window and that's what you saw and it had just been, it was a new design and I just thought, no, that ain't gonna happen in my stores. So you have to understand how a transa uh, transaction is made and what, how you need to facilitate that in your store design. I told you this was the, the dull part, but anyway. Um, so again, how, how do, do all your fixtures need to be on wheels? Do you need to, for instance, if you have a Warhol exhibition, you've got tons of product to sell. You need a big space to sell that. But if you have a 15th century Dutch painting small exhibition, you probably need one little table. It needs to be able to expand, it needs to change, it needs to roll away, it needs to roll back out, it needs to be able to stack up higher. Um, how, how are you going to be able to do that with your store design? Uh, one store that I had to work with, it took three people to move a shelf, a meter long shelf, because it was screwed in in four places and to move it and adjust the height was impossible. So it, we'd start over with that because the architects had designed it fixed. That's, you can only have a book that's this high. You can't have a book that's this high because the shelves don't move. You have to keep those things in mind. And bookstores, another story about how you tip the shelves and how you display books and things. So um, it's all about, you can't sell the fixtures. You've got to be able to move them and, fl and fluctuate um, how many fixtures you've got on the floor for peak times, etc. So keep that in mind. How, how fluid does it need to be? How mobile does it need to be? Yeah, this is another difficult one. Um, it's getting better. Museum stores are becoming more important to directors and architects are beginning to understand that there's storage issues. There stock rooms that need to be uh, near the site so that you can replenish, particularly when you've got volume. Uh, and so how far away are the, the, the storage? So therefore, do you need storage in the store? 
because often there isn't a stock room. Do you need stuff below the knee that can be, you know, you tell me if I'm wrong, but things like postcard display racks that open up and then the stock is kept in behind or just ways to make it possible to replenish when you're open seven days a week. All things to keep in mind. Um, uh, a little illustration of that when I did um, tech modern working with the architects again, I worked it out that it would take a member of the retail staff 23 minutes to walk to the stock room. Uh, <coughs> so if somebody, if you came in as a customer said, have you got that in this colour, always in the stock room? It was going to take 46 minutes of walking and then adding that to finding to come back. So we put the storage underneath. Those are things that take mother. There's the big ramp that you go into the Great Hall. We put the storage under there, but we had to really fight for that. Yeah. And the postcards are hidden behind there as well. So. Yeah, it's true. And when you showed that picture of the MoMA million pound gondola, million dollar gondola, I saw three mugs. I thought, okay, here's, here's a case in point. How much staff have you got to, you know, to replenish these things? Because if that's going to do a million pounds, my feeling would be there'd be 24 mugs on that rack. <laughs> because staff-wise, there's never enough staff often to replenish. But if they've got somebody who's going to go I think I talk about that in the next one. Um, if they've got visual merchandising staff and, and, and enough staff to replenish constantly, um, I know the British Museum has someone going around constantly just replenishing and refilling. Often these stores don't. So how bulletproof can you make the display units so that they can get enough product out there uh, to, to serve the customer without running out of it and then losing sales while they're doing that. So um, this, this is the boring part too is, you know, you need postcard racks, you need, do they, have, do they sell gift wrap, do they sell scarves, do they sell jewelry, do they sell all of those details, what kind of uh, individual fixturing do they need. I, when I was doing my London College of Furniture and Interior Design, I was sent to Harrods for a week and I had to sketch every uh, specific store fixture in the entire store from spools of thread to you know shoelaces to whatever anything that had a specific um, display unit had to be sketched so you you really need to know how to facilitate those um, things like scarves are quite difficult to if you've got a high volume of people going through to display and to you have to think about how that's going to happen and the signage is also very key to your role as well as how you're going to sign those those products pocket money bins for instance how are the kids going to know what price they are because a lot of them don't take stickers Cars, a lot of Carmen's product won't take a sticker at all so you need to tell them this is a euro or two euros or whatever. So how are you going to do that on your fixturing? How kind of, what kind of shelf talkers or prospect signage? How are you going to do that? How are you going to communicate that? Or even communicate what the original art that this product came from? How are you going to display that? Um, so yeah, so I think one of the key questions you need to ask your client is, do, you know, what is replenishment like? How much storage do you need? Who's going to do the visual merchandising? Because the stores we've just done in the uh, Arab Emirates, I know when we walked away after doing the merchandising in store that it's going to be difficult for the staff to replenish and display because they haven't uh, enough staff to really look after all of that and new product and when they sell out of something because we're not there on a monthly basis. So how do you make sure the store is always going to be able to be kept up? Um, yeah, and so again, how much product do you need to protect? Is the, if they're selling jewelry, can it be out on the counter or does it need to be in, under glass? If they're selling Iwaiwei products, does it need to be behind glass? Um, it's always more difficult to sell lower end jewelry out from under glass because you know, people need you know, customer service, they need somebody to hand it to them. They need, and often if you're busy, there's not that much time. So how can you help them sell more jewelry and protect the, the higher end jewelry and make it easily accessible to people. 
if it's sometimes as it is on the cash wrap in a glass thing and people are buying things, they can't see, the other customers can't see what's in it. So where do you put that? Where do you put that jewelry? Um, I spoke about this earlier. If you, want to, if you want the cash wrap at the back so people go through. <laughs> or, you know, it's, again, I'm just repeating myself there, but it's, it's really, really vital to a very good retail experience is where you put that cash wrap and how it, how it functions. Aha. So we, we're doing this together. This yeah, we are. are we sharing a microphone? Or? be here for the next week telling you the complexities of product development, but um, this is sort of an overview to give you an idea. Uh, I had an experience a couple of weeks ago with a client who sent me um, interpretive signage that had been designed by some designers and they had designed some product. Unfortunately, none of the product that they designed could actually physically be made and likely wouldn't sell because it really there was no connection to the actual site through this design work. So let's roll through. Okay, this is, um, Calms, I guess, again, has been talking about these magnificent institutions. Um, they can be challenging. A National Portrait Gallery in Scotland, um, it's a very difficult sell to create product around <laughs> portrait galleries because although there's some amazingly wonderful images that will sell and sell and sell, the majority of what you see is about history and it's about you know, the history of Scotland, for instance, in this case. So how do you make these things relevant to people and have fun with them? And what we did was we, we talked to some contemporary designers, one called Timorous Beasties, who just does incredible design work and um, asked them to create some product around the National Portrait Gallery to, to be contemporary, to be fresh, to be alive and things. And, and um, you can't really see it here, but we took details of paintings and into these polka dots, so a nose, an eye, an arm, a hand, or whatever, and created a whole range around that. And then we just took bits and pieces the arm, the ermine stole, and all of a sudden it became relevant to our customers because, to be honest, nobody really wants his face on their wall because he's not related to them. You know, I mean, <laughs> if it's a relative, fine, but if it isn't a relative, do you really, but he, he's fun when he's taken out of, out of context and things. Um, and uh, Robbie Burns, of course, is famous, and, and King James, the second, seventh, fourth, whatever he is, yes. One yeah, one of them. And, um, and the dogs and animals and art. So we just picked out things that, that you know, w would be fun and lively. This was the best seller. This is what I call men in tights uh, because there were so many paintings of men in kilts and with wonderful socks and leggings and things that we just collaged them together and all of a sudden it made a great fun product and yet it didn't demean the art. It didn't, it, it didn't sort of take away from the art, but it, it was a really a great, great item. And then we had fun with, uh, this is again about display and design. This is just a cutout uh, of styrofoam that we made mannequins in and things like that to say that 
This scarf design was from that portrait. Um, this guy's tie design is from his uh, clothing, um, again there. And then these are placemats and coasters that are just fun about Scottish history. And then it would have the provenance on the back of it. Um, so, okay. Again, uh, Mary Queen of Scots. No, Anne of Guys. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, oh. So again, you know, there's the portrait. There's the mug. The information is on a tag that goes in it. It's accessible. It's seven ninety nine or something like that, and it sells in multiples, and it displays well. So, um, this unit here, speaking of store design, um, is see through, but it has plexi plexi sections that go through in different colors, so that there's a see through area, but there's a backdrop for the product, and it's on wheels because events happen in the restaurant. And so you could move the whole store back and away. And that's what I mean about flexibility. Because I was also in charge of events and licensing and all these other things as managing director, I needed to make the space pay for me too. So this, we just pushed back. We could still actually function and work and sell during these events if we wanted to. But that could turn into a 250 uh, person event space because we made it mobile. Different kettle of fish altogether. Um, very large store. That's not a fish. <laughs> yeah. Oh, darn, my species. Um, yeah, we had uh, six weeks to do this. No, 10 weeks, sorry. 10 weeks to do this six, what did I say? It was, it was 6,000 square feet, so 500 square, I don't know, square meters. Anyway, um, big. And this is about theater, and it's about, you know, create, getting product in that works with your bespoke product. So this is an anatomically correct plush zebra um, in actual size. And we actually did sell those. And, but it sold everything else that was here. So it's about having fun and... And, and surprise, people took photo ops with this. You know, they'd put their kids on top of it or they'd come and stand underneath it and they were taking pictures. And that's what you want. It's about theater, it's about fun, it's about, you know, surprise factor. You want people to walk into the store and go, oh, it's different. Oh, oh, this is different. This isn't pencils and erasers and, you know, postcards. It's, it's got life. It's got some excitement and stuff. So we had a good time with that. This is great, because this guy actually um, is motion sensitive and would turn and watch you when you came in the store. So you'd walk in, and this wolf was, was uh, you know, it was a battery operated, and it was this size. And he turned and looked at you when you came in. And the message is preserve and protect. And it really caught people's attention and, and stuff. But again, the product. Uh, at, a, at a zoo store, you're going to say, excuse the boxes, you see, you see what I mean? Here. <laughs> this was still during setup, but um, who is your customer? And I mean, that was a best selling t shirt. These are best selling t shirts. Um, so it's a very different kettle of fish to the sort of more rarefied air of an art museum. So I hate four way spit thingies like that, but the volume that we, we did. We needed some way of merchandising it. Um, that wasn't my idea, but anyway, uh, we had the waterfalls on the rack there. So we told biozone stories in each grouping, and there would be books in there. So it was a mixed bag. You weren't you locked into um, using just uh, certain items on certain areas of the store. You can really, it's very flexible. Even though I hate slat wall, I like the stuff that you use, that micro thingy, but and there are other options now, but when you're doing, when you're on a budget, um, the, this company that actually runs this store, oh, excuse the minute, you see that there. Um, again, we were in setting up. Um, they're all about profit, all about profit. 
the, the client, the zoo itself, is all about ecology and you know, preserving, protecting and things. So we had to, I had to walk that line of high profitability, high turnover, but giving the right messages. Um, I, I thought you might be interested in this. I'm presuming you've heard of the Beatles. Um, <laughs> the, the, the Beatles uh, recorded all their um, albums in Abbey Road Studios in London. And this is the very famous um, uh, LP, LP cover. I'm presuming you know what an LP is. Um, <laughs> where they're walking across the Zebra Crossing. Now, uh, busloads of tourists arrive outside Abbey Road Studios. You can't go in there. Um, but people come out to pay homage because it's not just the Beatles, it's the Rolling Stones, it's Pink Floyd, it's all mad, you know, you two, you just name it, they've all recorded that. So they decided to open up the shop and they asked that we did design the shop, but they also asked us to design the, um, uh, the products or come up with ideas. Sorry. Oh. Sorry if you can hear. Um, so I, I just show you some uh, concepts. A lot of these have, have um, actually happened, um, but actually taking the studios themselves as inspiration. Uh, the actual building itself, pen holders, uh, paperweights, uh, looking at how um, the actual rec recording studios, the kind of uh, microphones, etc. I'm just having fun. Everybody uh, graffitis on the wall outside of Abbey Road. So um, uh, they have to repaint that wall every week. And then people start again and they get this homage to Pink Floyd and Ringo and John Lennon. Um, so there's a whole kind of fun element as well. I just hand these uh, designs to the uh, retail guys and get them to find out who to make them. Because uh, we don't have that kind of, of input. There's a new brand identity that they came up with, uh, so we were reflecting it in there. Uh, we also did, uh, for London Transport Museum, we came up with uh, a whole book full of, of ideas uh, for, for products, or so posters based around uh, London Transport Museum's um, uh, iconic uh, stations, etc. There was a big push for um, uh, getting people to use London Transport Museum to get outside of London and walk in the, the wonderful um, landscapes around there. So we came up with pic picnic ideas, Wellington boots, uh, backpacks. And just to complete this part of the, um, of, of the, the talk, uh, we're coming to an end. Um, the considerations. Um, will, will I go through that one? Yeah, or Do you want to fin on. finish the product part? Um, product development and some of the slides that showed there, the Wellington boots, the picnic backpack, etc., are very high minimum quantities and a lot of you, the people that you're going to be working with can't, can't accommodate that kind of uh, product. If, unless they're a big institution or have lots of outlets and high turnover. So it, it's all about balancing uh, price, quality, um, minimum order quantities, technical issues in producing product that can limit and inform product. Um, I think you know, it, it's important to know that and also, for instance, with the Abbey Road, you weren't allowed to use in fact, did you have copyright approval for that picture of the Beatles on the thingy? Because, you know, that's a big thing with art museums is that, um, for instance, the Dior show that's in Paris right now, which is spectacular, uh, there's no product in the shop. Dior wouldn't let them have anything. There are ways, there are always ways around that. You could still have relevant product, but the fact is that uh, copyright with artists, with collections, is very tricky and very difficult often. Um, Andy Warhol Foundation, Matisse, uh, all, all of the Picasso um, people, you, you have to have everything approved and it may be turned down. Uh, so there are a lot of artist rights and obligations you've got to, you know, will inform your product development. So I think when you're thinking about product, just be sure that it's actually something 
that could actually be achieved in, in, a, in a cost, you know, productive way. So, so that, that's kind of the, my main bugbear okay. with things that people suggest. This is where suggest. client and designer disagree, because I think come up with the concepts and then fight for the use yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, and there's always a way. There's always a way to, you know, to get around it, but it, it and I don't want to curb anybody's enthusiasm with that because it always comes up with other ideas. And the other way to, to get around that was working with the artists or working with local artists, local craftspeople who take their inspiration from the museum or the institution is to try and find people that, with whom the institution has a, a synergy and will come in and do you know, drawings, illustrations, things that, that are evocative of the collection and turn that into product. Uh, we work a lot with, with artists and designers and different people who will come up with ideas, so it's, it's absolutely true. But if the price and the quantity is not right, it's really difficult. So, um, and also, I'm a big believer in making sure you've got something at every price point because I, I find elitist retailing is, is no place in a museum store. You have to have the expensive, wonderful, amazing, aspirational things for sure, but you really, it does my heart good to know that there is something that everybody who comes in the door can afford and it's quality and it's something that they'll, they'll not throw out the next day. My son used to come home from museum things with the school with bits of plastic and stuff and a week later it'd be in the bin. You know, so I want to make sure that, that there's something valuable and affordable for everybody who comes through the door. Okay, so very quickly, um, just to kind of summarize the considerations for um, any uh, retail aspect of museums and cultural retail, is the client, understand them, understand them as a brand, understand the customer, which is the visitor, stroke customer, but remember, um, lots of people go to museum shops and don't go into the museum. As another statistic, which 92% of people uh, who visit museums expect to, to buy something from the shop. There's another one um, for you to think about. As Lee has been talking about, and you've got a wonderful expert here, product mix is vitally, vitally important. And understand the space and what you can do with that space and maximise it to, to the best. So, Natalia, keep going. Any questions on that part? No. No. Okay. We're kind of going yet. Yeah. Think, yeah. Okay, because it's uh, half past twelve. Um, okay. Um, I'm not sure how much about the actual project that everybody knows that they're going to be not, getting. Uh, not, not so much. Not Nothing. Nothing. Okay. <laughs> Surprise. So, so, so have I got to tell them? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, Do you want this? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, I'll stay here. Um, okay, um, the project is uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York is MoMA. Everybody calls it MoMA. It's going to come to Barcelona. <laughs> and there is a site uh, that Natalia has found that it's going to be going into. They know about it. Theoretically, yes. Yeah, they know about the site. <laughs> Um, and what I, uh, we as uh, the clients, want you to do is to come up with the concept for putting a MoMA store into this site in Barcelona, uh, which reflects the uh, essence of MoMA, what they're all about. And it's not unrealistic, as I've shown you, they're in Japan. Uh, they're in uh, other parts of New York. I know that they're going to expand into other parts of America. Um, I have worked with them for three years to get to the first stage. We have done that uh, concept, but I don't care what you come up with. I think I want you to use your imagination to do something uh, special for, for MoMA. And I think the considerations would be the Spanish 
uh, demographic, the kind of people that come to Barcelona, which is all the people that you've seen here, but they could be from ev everywhere because uh, this is an absolutely multinational um, city for tourists, visitors. Uh, the amount of uh, different languages I've been hearing out, uh, around, because in, in here is, it's uh, truly an opportunity. And I think the essence of the, the interesting thing about MoMA is they represent the very best of design historically and internationally and globally um, because they have a f uh, one floor dedicated to design and architecture as well as contemporary art and everything else. Um, so pretend I'm American. Uh, Pretend I'm a lady called Ruth Shapiro. Mm -hmm. Ruth Shapiro is the retail director of um, uh, MoMA. She's been working with the retail uh, team for 20 years. She knows everything. She's a New Yorker. Nobody messes with Ruth. She <laughs> wants uh, the very best. But I'd like you to think outside the box because I think there's opportunities. And it's interesting what Lee's just showing you the mix of retail and cafe uh, is something that's beginning to become more and more important as well. Uh, so it doesn't have to just be retail. Um, it, it could be, now I'm not sure how, what size of space that you're... Mm, 300 square meters. Right, that's good. Yeah, so that, yeah that, that's good. You could combine um, experience retail, cafe, uh, demonstrations, artist talks, all of that, that kind of thing w within it. So let me explain to you, it's taken me three years to understand MoMA <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm still doing it, but uh, let me try my best. So MoMA, it's on, um, how many people here have been to MoMA? Good, good. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, just a couple of questions. Who is MoMA, Museum of Modern Art? What is the design store? The design store is the store that is on the, uh, opposite the museum um, and the goals for the retail department. Um, their ambition is to be the most engaging muse museum of modern and contemporary art for everyone and the demographic uh, for MoMA is literally everyone. Um, it sees itself as a global museum. These are um, some of the shots. They, they have every single uh, contemporary artist you've ever thought of uh, in there, from sculpture to uh, paintings to installations. Um, and these are some of the, um, the, their statistics. They have 3.1 million plus uh, visitors to the museum. Uh, there's a 25 million plus digital interaction. Um, there are one and a half million visitors to their store, which is the one within the museum. Um, you can take all of these. Uh, 400,000 come to their social store. They have uh, 1 million transactions per year over all retail uh, channels. Um, and they're, they're claiming f 5 million visitors to uh, their website. Um, so they're, they're, they're really something. And they are seen as the market leaders in the... Uh, can I ask a uh, question then? Yeah. Reading that statistics about a million transactions, how many tills are you putting? Did you put in? Uh, <laughs> Me being the practical one. Here. <laughs> for for uh, well, that that that's across the whole. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the design store there was four. Yeah. Uh, okay. But it's one cash wrap with four. But they yeah. they now have um, uh, people with uh, touch pads. pads. Yeah. Touch pads. Yeah. Um, oh. Um. So the result, the role of the, uh, museum retail for MoMA is about uh, reflecting the programs, uh, enhancing the visitor experience, 
global outreach. They want to uh, talk to everybody in the world. No small ambition now. <laughs> they have sponsorships. Um, for instance, um, the Uniqlo uh, do a free Friday. So you can walk into, because you pay to go into MoMA on a Friday afternoon. There are queues down West 53rd trying to get in. And it's a nightmare. Um, and then endowment, um, the amount of money that privately goes uh, into MoMA is uh, funds it all. There is no government funding whatsoever for MoMA. It's all about trustees. Uh, <coughs> you're talking about some of the most, the richest people <laughs> in the world, the wealthiest people in the world who are on their board. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's an omni omnichannel business. Uh, I've talked about the locations. Um, it has international uh, uh, traffic. <coughs> and they have lots of product licensing partners. They, they, they work with people from all over the world in terms of licensing. <coughs> and their product is also uh, sold in museums all over the world. If you go to the uh, Design Museum in London, which opened a year ago now, <coughs> that has lots of MoMA-based uh, products. Everybody, f but they also sell a Lessie and all of, all of the, the, the great design-like products. Excuse me a minute, this shows you a percentage of their business uh, at the moment, um, based on uh, the, the, the different locations. It doesn't include Japan. Uh, at the moment, the museum store, the main museum store in the museum is closed down because the whole of the building is being refurbished to the touched on area. That will open in two years' time. These are some of the guys that, uh, and this is, this is a mixture of curators and the buyers. And they work very closely with, especially the design curators, on what products, and it's giving you an idea. So you've got everything there from cooking implements to scarves, uh, to <coughs> plates, handbags. Um, they sell pretty much everything, uh, but it's always design-led. It's always um, uh, curated in that way. And what's interesting is that MoMA was the first art museum to establish a curatorial department dedicated to our architecture and design. So that's 1932. Um, and hopefully you'll be familiar with um, the designers and architects who designed all of um, these items, for instance. Um, they have some wonderful um, products in there. So what does it stand for as a brand? Design that is innovative, beautiful and practical. Um, I think uh, we, we can share these slides I'm happy for this part because rather than everybody trying to remember them all, um, I'll pass this on to the, the Natalia and she can distribute it. Um, interesting, that bottom line come inside, discover the world's most inspiring design objects. Uh, that's what MoMA's all about, and that's what the store has to reflect. Um, I'm trying to remember. Oh, this is about the, uh, the design system, how the actual branding has to work. Uh, and that needs to be reflected throughout the shop. Um, they have direct-to-consumer channels, so there's the design catalogue, there's the website. Um, obviously, that, that, that's becoming more and more important. The customer. Um, I've, I've found this um, very interesting. Educate me. That's one of the things, and they've researched this, that's what people want. So that could be from school kids to seniors. Delight me. Um, so delight me with the, the products. Uh, New Yorkers go to MoMA to buy their Christmas presents. Uh, they go to MoMA to buy the tableware that they're going to put on their tables for their dinner party. They won't bother going into uh, the museum. They'll go there because they know they're going to get the very best of uh, design products. Um, Inspire Me is a little glimpse of our um, design for the des design store, which was all about uh, curating, a, a way of curating. But taking Lee's point, down below, lots of storage. 
<laughs> Product mix. This is the percentages that, uh, uh, kind of percentages that um, uh, Lee touched on. So you're looking at stationary products, really great, notepads, uh, pens, pencils, books, uh, quite small, but mainly based around MoMA pubs, as they call it, MoMA publications, because they have a, a vast array of, um, of, of books. Children's products, 9%, that's the really important part. Desk, tech and tools. Tech is becoming really important for them. They have um, uh, everything from uh, turntables uh, through to headphones, through to uh, objects that react to you so that it tells you about the weather. Oh, the, I mean, the, the, it's really kind of very leading edge, way more than any other retailer that I can, I can think of, actually. Tabletop and kitchen is a fast... Um, uh, opportunity, but look at jewellery, apparel and accessories, they sell designer handbags, they sell great jewellery, they sell um, uh, jewellery that's been designed, they've commissioned it, they work with designers and artists and architects to come up with objects that will go in their stores, um, they're, you know, they, they are right, right at the, the very top of the tree. So you've got everything from skateboards with Andy Warhol, uh, soup cans, uh, books on Picasso, sculpture, uh, Henry Matisse cutouts, um, um, Mondrian uh, scarves. And as we said, they've had to work on the licensing with that as well. Um, the, the product launches, they have MoMA exclusives, if you see the, uh, the radio at the end. Design classics, that clock there goes back, I think, to the 1930s, uh, maybe in the 1950s, actually. Um, innovative. The, um, the, uh, uh, the, the book light, it's a book uh, that goes up. When you open it up, it's a light, and you charge it with a um, USB. Um, I've got one, it's great. <laughs> I get a really good discount. Yeah. Um, uh, they have partnerships. I mentioned it. Uniqlo. Um, they've. Um, uh, you can see some of uh, the products here. Um, Kickstarter. Um, they come up with Kickstarter-funded products, so they will actually help designers kickstart into into products. Um, and then, hey, um, this is the one on the uh, the far end there at the bottom. Hey, do wonderful products. They uh, gave them the whole store just to kind of um, everything from uh, specs to uh, real, really cool uh, design products. The space, uh, they at the moment have the flagship museum store, which is going to be opened in two years' time. There's the design store on 53rd Street. There's the Soho store, which is a two floor store. Um, uh, 517 square meters, so half the size of what you're uh, going to uh, get at the moment uh, for the project. And then there's the design stores in uh, Tokyo and now for the rest of Japan. Um, and these are just some of the uh, designs that we did. But I want you to ignore all that. I want to see your um, uh, inspiration. So uh, the process that we had to go through, which um, we're into our third year with MoMA, uh, that's how long it can take, is evaluating uh, the existing store, the pros and cons, uh, looking at connecting to the museum and understanding other retail um, connections and locations around you know, the district. And there's a little aside, uh, there's this gentleman called Donald Trump <laughs> who uh, has a tower called Trump Tower. Trump Free Day, I think. And the, uh, it's on West 55, which is two streets away from MoMA. Uh, the whole place is surrounded with this wall of security. Uh, soldiers, uh, big trucks blocking uh, the street, etc. The visitor numbers for MoMA have gone that way ever since uh, Mr. Trump got in. So they all love him there too, just as much as I do. They're protecting uh, the wrong way. Yes. The, <laughs> way. Um, the merchandise is a mixture of uh, 
past and future. Uh, this was how uh, we ended up laying out um, the, the store. Um, I'll use the, the cursor. So this is the entrance. This is the design store, West 53rd. Swing is uh, the American term for visual merchandising. Uh, we decided to have tabletop here and mix that up with swing, so that could be a, that could be a really cool chair um, through to um, a, a really great great lamp. Um, scarves, a very oh, a very big uh, jewelry counter, which was delivered. Uh, two days before the store was going to open and uh, somebody dropped it and smashed it. Um, kitchenware in this, one, in this area. Um, the cash rack, in fact that's expanded to uh, four people. Uh, clocks on their product display and then a whole dedicated area to tech and lighting um, and then apparel, clothing and then swing so product range of uh, seasonal or a special display uh, goes there and there and then there's the window display. I don't think anybody should um, look at this too seriously <laughs> but I, I think uh, it's, that's the kind of thing that I have to account for. Operational considerations, how does it work, how do you restock, how do you shop um, it, the shop didn't look this, this is what was happening to actually when we were, everybody was merchandising it before it opened. The budget, super, super uh, important. Lots of negotiations uh, about that. Um, and it was in New York, so the cost of doing anything in New York versus what you would do here or indeed London, multiply it by five. Um, and then, this was a joke one, the collaborative, but a serious one. A collaborative and iterative process. The amount of layers of opinion about the shop was just astonishing. Because you've all heard of Terence Conran. Terence Conran came up uh, with the comment, design is a bastard profession, because every bastard thinks that they know how to do it. Um, and Everybody has it, and we were talking about a director who said he occasionally shops in Fifth Avenue <coughs> and has no interest in retail whatsoever. Uh, but the amount of interference from that uh, was just a massive fight, so that, that kind of ends. You haven't got any of that problem um, for, for this project, but just to show you what you're letting yourself in for. Gracias. Gracias. <laughs> Sigur. Sigur. Okay, I'm gonna put it on the cameras. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. General question. Yeah. So, what is the place of the light, of the lighting, direct and decorative in your designs? Honestly. Okay. Uh, absolutely fundamental. Um, there's different kinds of light um, and that, that's a very very serious consideration it's a very good question um, we had uh, ambient uh, you also have to consider the ambient light um, and then there's getting the, the correct coloration um, in uh, the design store for MoMA we had lights that uh, did a, a five degree beam through to a 30 degree beam. Um, but with lighting, you've got to think, because I'm kind of, I know that 
Lee's going to say the same thing, so I'll do it. How do you change the light bulbs? All of those kind of, of issues. But with LED, um, that is uh, company, that's now kind of solving itself, but it's still not perfect. Um, it never will be. And then, Focus. The, I, I don't know about the site, how much daylight um, that, that you're choosing is. Yes, right. Because there is that thing about uh, adjusting the light during the day so that as it gets darker, the, um, the, the shop changes. And then lots of um, stores, as uh, again Lee said, will have events. So uh, in terms of the, um, the, the settings, you need to be able to change them accordingly. Um, and also, I mean, my feeling is you need feature areas and hot spots and you need to, the, the lighting, to my mind, you're the expert on this, but it needs to come and go throughout the display so that people can see things. Um, I mean, if you think of a row of, let's say, a row of white shirts or books neatly folded like this, and then you put one blue one in the middle, how that pops. The lighting has to be the same in the store for me. It has to be, you have to be able to really see things clearly and get people to walk in and, and see things without being overwhelmed. And that's the other thing we haven't talked about is, is space, is about where you can have nothing so that, so that these focal points will really jump out at you and you can really uh, call people's attention. Because if you throw too much stuff at them, they won't see anything. So how to have hot spots, how to have feature walls, how to have uh, feature gondolas, how to have things so that the lighting can, you know, change as well over those spots, that, depending on what merchandise yeah. you put uh, on it. And the, I mean, the other interesting thing, and it'd be worth you doing some research on this, is um, a shelving that's got integral lighting and is no longer a holy grail, it's actually very easy to do. Um, but also getting digital in there, so USB, so that you can have um, interaction and touch screens, etc. Um, those are the, uh, I'm slightly um, cynical about uh, how much touch screen um, technology customers actually use to, uh, to do it. But there's interreactions, and th there's all of that kind of opportunity now, which is really going in there very interesting way. Um, but the, the, the integral lighting within shelving is, is a, a really important one at the moment. And um, there's a company called Vitra who uh, have come up with a, um, a, a system that can actually do all that. That's actually what we used in MoMA. Um, and we really pushed them like how um, drove them mad to try and get it right. But So they've developed our product um, based around what we, we pushed them on. But, uh, that's by the way. Any other questions? No? Everybody's okay. looking completely battered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have finished. Thank you very much for the lecture. <laughs> well, we will see what happened at the end of the course and which projects do we have. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> well, we want to see what they turn out like too. So, <laughs> can we come back and judge them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, happy to do so. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Thank okay, you. It was so, fun. Uh, we meet tomorrow. Everything is clear. The time. And Yeah, the visit is gonna, yeah, I know.